The Theater of Blood is one of, if not the hardest, PVM encounter to learn in the game. If learning with low kill count randoms, I would consider it more difficult to learn how to get consistent completions than the Inferno. And this is because making a single mistake in the raid can end in your entire team getting wiped as a result of it. It's much harder to learn than Cox because when your team wipes, you have to start over, which makes learning Verzik at the end of the raid an absolute nightmare. Of course, because it is difficult, it is also rewarding. Tob is currently the best money maker in the game besides ulting. Nightmare does come close. Consistent, efficient trio teams can make over 10 mil GP an hour if quickly completing raids. This guide is meant to be for beginner to intermediate players, as there are plenty of more advanced techniques I haven't used yet. Things like using Phoenix necklaces at bloat or 70-50 stacking at maiden. I might make a follow-up video in the future going over some of these techs. I have over 250 KC, but Tob is an endless ocean when it comes to improving. I would highly recommend using the chapters I place in the time bar of this video, as a chunk of the information in this video will be aimed at people who are simply looking to improve their raids and may not apply to someone who has never done Tob before. Let's look at the requirements. The theater actually has significantly lower requirements than chambers. Keep in mind these are absolute bare minimum requirements, and not having something listed will often prevent teams from taking you. For stats, these requirements are straight from the We Do Raids Discord. Melee stats actually matter the most, as you'll be using melee in every single room of the theater. 94 Mage is a necessity for the Freezer roll at Maiden, as you need Ice Barrage. Even a higher Mage allows you to keep your Prims on at Maiden with Imbued Heart Boost. Even if you aren't freezing, you want 94, so you can also cast Vengeance. Having a high prayer level is also very important, as not only does it mean you need less super restores through the raid, but your prayer is also restored every room you complete. Agility levels actually also do matter as well, especially at bloat. Stats matter much more than gear, so I highly recommend maxing your combat if you intend on grinding the theater for a long period of time. I personally just AFK'd combat at Ammonite Crabs in between raids until I was max combat. Having a Taste of Hope completed for the Draken's Medallion is also incredibly useful as it teleports you straight to top. You also need to have completed Haunted Mine for the Salve Amulet and your Western Hard Province Diary for Elite Void and Crystal Halberd. I did say 90 combat stats are the bare minimum, but I seriously would highly recommend simply getting max combat before starting Tob if you want to grind it hard for money. Stats are always greater than gear. To put this into perspective, 90 versus 99 strength is literally a 10% DPS difference. This is 50% of the upgrade from Tentacle Whip to Scythe. When it's so easy to train combat in Nightmare Zone, why would you make it hard for yourself in the hardest raid in the game? The only combat stat that really doesn't need to be high in the raid is defense, but even that stat will benefit you if you get it to 99 first. Finishing any room in Tob instantly restores your prayer, health, and run energy, but not your stats. Dying in a room at Tob does not immediately end the raid, but you will be caged, and if your entire team dies, the raid will end, and you'll have to pay 100k to reclaim your items. I'd highly recommend filling your desk coffer with items, as reclaims will pull from your coffers before they pull from your bank. Dying as a hardcore Iron Man in any room instantly revokes your status, even if your team does not wipe. Unlockable items that are absolutely required are full elite void, including each helmet, and crystal halberd, salve amulets, stockpile of these as you'll be dropping them each raid, I collected 500 in under an hour, assembler, dragon defender, rune pouch, and both rigor and augury. Teams will likely turn you down if you are missing anything listed here. Most people do raids in teams of 4 or 3. As a learner, I would recommend doing 4s, as 3 mans make much more money per hour, but someone dying often seals the fate of the raid. 5 mans are much harder due to the way the raid scales, and the raid doesn't scale below trios, so smaller raids are typically more of a challenge run than anything. Before I get into setups, we need to lay out the roles, as this will change what you need to take quite a bit. In quads, there are 4 different roles. There's South Mage, North Mage, Melee DPS, and Range DPS. These refer to who is freezing, on what side during Maiden, and who is doing what role at Nihilocus. South Mage typically mages at Nihilos, with North Mage meleeing. The DPSers will take a Rune Pouch as well, but instead of Freezes, they will take Lunars with Mud, Astral, and Death Runes, allowing them to cast both Pot Share and Vengeance. These roles will constantly be casting Vengeance, basically whenever it is off cooldown. South Mage will typically take some kind of Mage offhand, so they have 100% accuracy on the ticks at Maiden. I would take a Book of Darkness, as you can drop it after Sotitsek. As well as a small pile of Soul Runes to allow them to tank at Maiden, and heal that damage back from the pile. They will also will take an Imbued Heart as well, to assist with their Maging in the Nihilocus room. 
The North Mage will just take a 3 tick melee weapon unless they are using a whip. The melee DPS will take their 3 tick melee weapon, again unless they use a whip, along with a BGS. The ranged DPS will take a regular ranging pot and a small pile of about 20 chins to assist the South Mage at Maiden, along with their BGS. For trios, you just cut that melee DPS roll. For more advanced teams, I will often have the South Mage be the only one who brings freezes and freeze all of the ticks 1 to 4 south at Maiden, which is tick perfect. And having the other two players machine gun the N1 and N2 tick spawns at Maiden with Blowpipe. This allows your team to have an additional Venger, which is actually very helpful for speeding up the raid. This is only worth doing if your South Mage is very comfortable with freezing. For gear, this setup is the absolute bare minimum. If you are learning, I would recommend sticking with Full Void until you feel more comfortable with your supplies after completing the raid. Using no supplies on Verzig Phase 2 is usually a good indicator you can step it up a bit. Then throw in the more advanced setup when you're more comfortable. The Swift Blade in the setup is a melee roll specific item for the Nilocus room and is only necessary for the roll if you're using Scythe. This can be swapped for about 20 Black Chinchampas if ranging or about 20 Soul Runes if you are the main mage at Maiden for Blood Barrage. If you are bringing BGS, replace a brew with the BGS. If you are using brews in the room before Verzik, there is no point in incorporating divines into your setup yet. Chally, Claws, and Hammer are all used in various rooms, so take all three spec weapons. Along with the BGS if it is a part of your role. Yes, you still use Hammer if you bring BGS in most of the rooms. If you are a learner but have a scythe, I would recommend still taking a whip along with the scythe to use for phase 2 as doing a two-step with Whip is much easier than Scythe Walking Verzik. I usually have learners start attempting Scythe Walk after around 10kc. Make sure your blowpipe is loaded with rune darts at the minimum, as these will make you more money than they lose due to how profitable Tob is. A Blood Fury is also a great option if you are using a Whip while you are learning. I wouldn't recommend using one with a Scythe, as it makes it use three charges per hit, and that's pretty expensive. A Blade of Saildor is around 5% more DPS than a Tentacle Whip, this is actually a pretty decent option to bridge the gap while grinding for the cash for a scythe. Now it does unfortunately lose the whip's ability to poison, which is actually needed for phase 2 Verzik for the purple ticks, which means you will need to either bring a Serp Helm, switch and avoid ranged and pipe the tick, or have someone else on your team poison the tick for you if you are taking the Seldor. I wouldn't recommend imbuing a Seldor if you plan on using it for Tob, as you will make enough for a scythe before being even close to the 1000 crystal shard imbue cost. You can directly buy crystal shards by buying enhanced crystal teleport seeds and turning them in for 150 shards each. Keep in mind, if you are taking a Serp Helm with the Saildor, because the Saildor has cheaper cost to hit than the Whip, it's actually almost the same supply cost. A Scythe is almost always 25% more DPS than a Tentacle Whip. The DPS increase is so great and will speed up your theater completions so much that it will actually make you more money in the long run than a Tentacle Whip, even with it costing about 1k a swing. When people say they are doing a Scythe rebuild, this is why they are doing it. Once you are feeling more confident in your brood count for Verzik and switches at Nilocus, you can throw in the intermediate setup. This setup will help you a lot more over the basic one if you are using a Scythe, but it is still worth using with a whip. You can swap out Bandos for Fighter Torso and Obsidian Legs until you can afford it. We drop the Void Melee for Bandos as melee DPS is important for every room. If you are an Ancient and not bringing BGS, bring a Serp Helm. If you are the BGS there of the team, bring a Face Guard, as this will give your BGS an additional max hit. When you need poison for phase 2, just make sure someone with a Serp Helm is on each side of Verzik to hit the purple ticks. This setup also drops Bruise completely and incorporates Divines, as you really shouldn't even be using food in the rooms before Verzik unless something has gone wrong. I bring one less Super Combat, as the one Divine Super Combat is enough for the whole raid before Verzik, and the final Super Combat is just for phase 3 Verzik. You can take an additional super combat instead of an angler if you want to be on the safe side. I have my void mage in range in these spots of the inventory on purpose, as during the locus boss for your switches, it allows them to work in both directions, keeping it simple. Which is what you want when you incorporate bandos, as it makes your melee switch much harder. You can optionally also take a void melee helm to keep the switching simple for just the Nilocus boss if you are struggling with it. I take a Guthix rest for tick eating things throughout the raid. If you are a non-freezer, you can elect to leave the Void Mage Hood and Magic Cape in the bank. This will allow you to take some more food to Verzik, but it does make the setup a bit more annoying at Nilo Boss in my opinion. You just switch your staff and occult back to whatever you equip during the boss after you do your two mage hits. There are more advanced setups that involve things like Inquisitor switches for hammer hits and Ancestral instead of Void Mage, but as I have not used these very much, I won't be giving a setup for it in this guide. I highly recommend hopping in the We Do Raids Discord if looking for other people to group with 
They have a very strict ban list for scammers and some great guides of their own for Tob. World 416 is also a great option if looking for randoms to free-for-all with instead of splitting. Joining a PVM clan is one of the best ways to get consistent raids, although these typically have pretty strict requirements to join. Being in voice comms or something like Discord with your team will also make your raids so much easier and smoother. Every room benefits from quick communications. There are a lot of little things you can set up in Runelite and the game's settings that are really important to get right before you enter a raid. One of the most important things is turning off auto-retaliate. Leaving this on has gotten me killed multiple times. Having F keys bound to keys that are most easily accessed by you and the key remapping plugin in Runelite is extremely important. F keys are practically necessary in the Nilocus room. If you haven't learned to use F keys by this point, now would be a good time to learn. I would highly recommend tagging every main boss that moves in the raid in NPC indicators and highlighting their tile, as it shows you where your character will go to attack them. This is most important at Bloat and Verzik. Having a Highlight Current True Tile ticked on in the Tile Indicator plugin also helps immensely, showing where your character is from the server's perspective. There are a bunch of external plugins you can find below plugins in the Plugin Hub, which really, really help with Tob. There's Tob Damage Counter, which is useful for showing what percent of the damage you have done each room. It also will alert you in the chat if someone forgot to equip their salve at Bloat, or if someone has healed P3 Verzik by getting hit by a tornado. Tob Health Bars plugin replaces the orbs in the top left with the full names of the people in the raid. This really helps with knowing who needs to spec at what time during Phase 1 Verzik. There are also various other Tob plugins which are helpful, which I would recommend checking out. I would also highly recommend downloading the external Rune Watch and We Do Raids banlist plugins if you are attempting to form teams with randoms. This will highlight people in orange who have been added to the banlist for either of these. This will help prevent you from getting scammed by people who steal drops instead of splitting when they're supposed to. The anti-drag plugin is extremely useful for gear switches. It prevents you from accidentally dragging your items all over the place. I keep it set at 10, but you should find a number that is comfortable for you. Before you enter the raid, you want to pre-pot a Divine Ranging and Divine Super Combat, eat a shark to restore your health, then eat an Anglerfish, and finally use an Imbued Heart to boost your magic. The heart is really important for the two freezers. If the DPS don't have a heart, it is okay to skip it. When forming the party at the board, you typically want the South Mage to form the party, as Maiden will prioritize attacking people in the team top to bottom of the party, allowing the Mage to run in and tank and healing back hits with their Blood Barrage. Make sure you have both your Hammer and Defender equipped to allow you to bring an additional piece of food into the raid. Before I explain any of the bosses, I want to lay out some groundwork for how this guide will work. I will be going in order through each room, laying out how the bosses work and all of their attacks first, then what you should do in the explained fight, and then how to improve in the fight. The improvements I list will be ordered from easiest first to hardest. Feel free to skip improvements if you are brand new to Tob, get some KC, then come back to this video and watch them. With some context and experience as to how the rooms work, this guide will help you much more in general. Some quick basics that apply to every room in Tob as well. You want to be fully potted at almost all times, as it is a massive DPS increase. Most importantly is when you hammer spec bosses, as if you are not potted or not praying piety, your chance of hitting a spec is dramatically reduced. Part of the skill of Tob is knowing optimal times to brew and when to repot. If you're using regular potions or imbued heart at Nyla Room, it is worth using preserve the entire time. Knowing how your spec weapons work is very important. The Dragon Warhammer drains 30% of a boss's current defense, whereas a BGS drains a boss's defense by the amount of damage you just dealt. So if your average hit with a BGS spec is higher than the amount a Dragon Warhammer hit would drain, it's better to BGS spec than Warhammer. This is after two hammer hits for Maiden, and after three hammer hits for Zerpus. Dragon Claws is the highest DPS special attack and extremely accurate, while also being very fast at four ticks, but it does take 50% of your special attack meter. These are used to quickly drop bosses that have a dangerous phase, or if your defense lowering special attacks won't be benefiting you at that point in the fight, like at Sodateg. The Chally is the highest possible damage you can obtain with a single spec, but can be inaccurate, especially compared to Dragon Claws. And it is also very slow at 7 ticks. Chally specs are typically used at points in fights right before they transition to an invulnerability phase, or when it would outright kill them, so that the 7 tick weapon cooldown is avoided completely. The goal in each room is to not use any food, but as a learner, don't be afraid to use it to get through the raid. It's usually better to eat than to die. I often will end up eating at Maiden, Bloat, or Nilos when things are starting to go wrong. If you drank more than one brew at Maiden, or if someone died, 
Typically a good sign you should reset and try again to maintain supplies. As a learner, it is good to eat at Soda Seg to survive. As you get more experience, you can simply do things like start flinching Soda Seg when you're low health and take eating the orbs to further avoid supply use. Never use food at Zarpus as you will desperately need the food for Verzik, and there is really no circumstance where you should have to eat at Zarpus. It's better to die than eat food in this case. When first entering the raid, the first boss you will encounter is the Maiden of Linguini. Before you even enter the room, you should drop a couple food outside to allow you to equip a two-handed weapon and take your boots off if not meleeing. Items dropped in Tob will stay on the ground for an extremely long time because it is an instance. When entering the room, and any room in the entire raid, it is best to have the entire room spam clicking on the door and have the person who formed the party start the room, allowing the entire team to enter on the same tick. Maiden is actually one of the harder rooms, which is good because we get it right out of the way at the start. Maiden has a unique mechanic where many of her attacks will heal her, and the more she is healed, the more her max hit rises for all of her attacks as well. Generally, if this room is going poorly, it is a downward spiral. Maiden wipes are not uncommon if your freezers are not on point. If more than 5 ticks are let through, Maiden can easily start hitting over 30s through prayer every single attack. Maiden is static on the west side of the room and will throw basic magic attacks at the player closest to her. These magic attacks have a chance to drain the stat of the style of the player is using. Like if you're wielding a scythe, she will drain combat. If wielding a staff, she will drain magic, etc. As soon as Maiden begins the animation for the attack, who she will send the attack at and how much damage it will deal is already decided. If two players are next to Maiden on the same tile, she will attack the person with the higher orb order. She also will occasionally throw out blood splats on the ground where everyone is currently standing and to random tiles around a single player as well, which rapidly damages players standing in them each tick and heals Maiden for the same amount. These hit you faster the closer you are to Maiden, up to one tick after the animation if standing right next to her. She will not throw blood splats again until at minimum three attacks have passed. The amount these damage you goes up depending on how much she has been healed, to the point where these can hit 30s each tick. Maiden can also randomly spawn blood spawns. The chance for them to spawn is doubled if someone steps in the blood she has thrown. The most that can be in the room at once is eight. These spaghettios roam around the room, leaving a trail of blood behind them. Stepping in this is the exact same as stepping in thrown blood. It damages you and heals her, and scales with her healing. At 70%, 50%, and 30% of Maiden's health remaining, Maiden will spawn a set of Nilocus, two per person in the raid, up to 10. These will immediately begin walking to Maiden, and if they reach her, they will heal Maiden for their full hit points remaining. Each has 200 health. The community has labeled these North 1 through 4 and South 1 through 4. The goal is to freeze all of these ticks either loose or in stacks where possible and killing the final clump with ice barrages or chins, and the other players in the raid will attack the loose ticks, preventing Maiden from healing at all. For most players, I would recommend starting with full melee gear equipped, with Dragon Warhammer spec ready, with Piety and Protect from Magic enabled. The BGSers on their team should have their main melee weapon equipped, and attack with that until the team dumps both of their hammer specs on the boss, then dump both BGS specs. It is efficient to BGS over hammer if two hammer hits landed successfully. You should only hammer if they didn't land at least that many. If the BGSer hits fairly high, Maiden's defense will be reduced to zero. If you're new to Maiden, I would immediately switch into Blowpipe and use that the entire fight from here on, removing your prims. The reason you do this is to avoid the blood splash she throws as you have much more time to react. The two non-mages should be constantly throwing vengeances at the person tanking at any given time for free damage. Make sure you're prepared to move whenever Maiden throws blood, Someone stepping in it can quickly fill the room with blood spawns. If you are a non-mage in this room, you should stand relatively close to Maiden to tank the hits during the fight. Your south mage will be tanking the hits above 50% of the time, but the bridge needs to be capped when they aren't tanking. This is why the south mage is first in the party to take priority on attacks. After you have damaged Maiden to 75-80%, to the mages are going to want to quickly switch into their mage gear, activate augury, and highlight ice barrage with mouse readied over where the ticks spawn. The timing for this is very tight, and missing freezes is a great way to wipe your team very quickly, so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get ready. One of the most common ways I see learners miss freezes is they either forget to activate augury or don't equip their void gloves, so make sure everything is set up correctly. The two mages now try and freeze all of the ticks, either loose or in the clump. The timing on this can be very tight, and you will likely wipe your team a couple times just learning. It's good for the non-freezers to immediately throw some hits at north slash south 1 slash 2 
just in case the mage misses the freeze. To avoid splashing, you need to have at least plus 55 magic attack bonus with augury enabled and avoid setup. To hit this attack bonus, you need to either have A, take your boots off, or B, take an offhand magic weapon. South Mage will often take a Book of Darkness. If you leave your boots on without an offhand, you can still have 100% accuracy with imbued heart boost, but it requires you not tank any hits in your magic gear to risk reducing your magic boost to splashing levels. I wouldn't rely on this if you don't know what you're doing. With a solid team that catches all freezes, I typically don't bother taking my boots off, as I don't need to tank in magic gear ever, and I often quickly need to switch into melee gear. After each freeze, you want to move in case Maiden has thrown blood. Keep in mind, if you even have to tank blood splats, that is a lot better than missing any freezes. If you are the North Mage, in a typical team, you will be freezing North 1, North 2, and North 3. North 1 and 2 will be frozen outside of the clump, and 3s will perfectly fall within the clump. If you have immediately clicked North 1, you can just cast Barrage ahead of time on each next tick, as the delay will make them always freeze in the proper position. This is a 3 tick window, so if you are even slightly late, you will miss your 3s. If your timing felt slow on the first tick, it probably was, so skip 2s and make sure you freeze 3s in the clump. It's always better to miss 1 tick rather than 2, as 1 and 2 are loose spawns and 3s typically stack 2 ticks. The ticks spawn in random positions, and sometimes you will not have some ticks. If I'm missing either 2s or 1s, I typically will freeze the tick twice, if I properly time the first freeze, as this is not only free damage, but helps time getting threes in the clump. After you've frozen everything, quickly switch back into ranged gear and kill your loose ticks outside of the clump. If your team forgot chins, you can throw one or two barrages at the final clump to help the south mage whittle them down. If you are the south mage, the timing is a bit less tight, but it can be more awkward. And far more deadly if you mess up. The south mage typically freezes south 1 slash 2 and 4s. On south side, you can actually get both 2s and 4s in the clump. So you will immediately freeze south 1, and then wait a bit until south 2 is closer to maiden to freeze it. When 4s are one step from the clump, I freeze them. There are very often 4 ticks clumped together in 4s, so missing that is an extremely devastating mistake. This immediately heals maiden 800 health and dramatically increases her max hit. Always freeze earlier than you think rather than later. Your team can deal with 4 ticks being frozen outside of the clump, but they cannot deal with 4 ticks hitting maiden. If South misses 4s twice, it almost certainly will end in a wipe. Once you have everything frozen, you can run in front of Maiden to start tanking attacks, and cast Blood Barrage on the Clump to restore your own health. If you are at full health at this point, just cast Ice Barrage until it drops lower, as this does more damage. If you are the ranged DPS, you should immediately begin throwing Chins at the pile as the South Mage freezes 4s. Make sure you have the Chins set to Medium Fuse and stand 4-6 to six tiles away to get the maximum accuracy bonus. Make sure you communicate with your mage. If they need a lot more healing, you may want to throw less chins and allow them to blood barrage more. The melee DPS basically just stays on boss the entire time. It's a good idea to help your team finish off the loose ticks. The mages have frozen with your pipe. Otherwise, you should always just be attacking the boss. After 70s, as a mage, there's typically some blood spawns by now. Make sure you freeze any nearby. If there's more than four blood spawns, I usually will start piping blood spawns the mages have frozen. It's extremely difficult to manage many more spawns than this, and stepping in them makes even more of them spawn. Repeat the same strategies for the 50 spawn, switching into mage gear early, and the 30 spawn, again, switching early. Once 30s are dealt with, if you have spec regenerated before the maiden dies, you can switch into melee gear and throw a chal or claw spec at the boss. When she's done for, go back through the gate, pick up your food, and move on to bloat. Make sure to equip your salve at this point. There are quite a few techniques you can employ when fighting maiden to improve kill times. When entering the room at Maiden, you can start either in full mage gear or range gear if you own a Tebow, and throw either an ice barrage or Tebow shot at Maiden, getting a single attack for free. Then while running to the boss, quickly switch into your melee gear and hammer. Here's a DPS chart for the main weapons at Maiden. Scythe beats all weapons at Maiden, no matter her current defense, but Blowpipe and Tebow are both fairly close. Blowpipe with Dragon Darts overtakes Tebow at 46 defense. Another easy way to improve at Maiden is to start using a Scythe as a DPSer through the whole fight. Avoiding blood splats can be trickier doing this, as you have to move as she attacks to avoid them this close, as blood splats hit you a tick after the animation begins. Get in the habit of moving every time she attacks in order to avoid this. She attacks every 10 ticks. If your team has a lot of scythes, you can attempt to skip 30s. This is pretty simple in a four-man team. In trios, it can be pretty RNG dependent. For this to work, you will want to use only one spec each at the beginning of the fight, 
The goal is getting two landed hammer specs and two decent BGS specs. Throwing an additional single hammer spec to hit two specs before the BGSer if they didn't land. The BGSer can throw an additional spec if they hit very low, usually if they hit below 40 damage. The reason you maintain spec is so you can claw later. In a trio, the BGSer will dump both of their specs after two hammers have landed. This means when 30 spawn, the majors will completely trash the idea of clumping the Nilos and freeze them all as quickly as possible, immediately getting back on boss. Everyone will switch into melee gear as quickly as possible to DPS the boss, immediately dumping claw specs. If the mages have maintained Avenge through the fight, make sure you communicate this to your team if you don't have Avenge as a freezer. They can stand north of the boss without mage prey on for an attack to add additional massive damage. Ideally, the team would allow both to take a full damage Avenge hit. When Maiden hits 8-10% to health remaining, all four of you should dump Chally specs to finish Maiden off. If you are fast enough, none of the ticks will reach Maiden, and she will just immediately die, saving a lot of time. If the mages let any ticks through, you should usually just abort the skip and just kill the ticks as normal. It is still possible in forest to get the skip if one tick made it through. If your south mage is capable of freezing all and notices they froze the first tick fast enough, they can communicate with the north mage so they only freeze north one through two and then get back to the boss, the south mage freezing the rest. This will give you an additional two scythe swings on Maiden, greatly increasing the chance of the skip succeeding. In a trio, I will often employ the machine gun method. This requires incredibly good timing on the South Mage's part. Then the North Mage could also do this. Typically, it's simplest to just have the South side freeze all. South Mage will attempt to freeze every single tick south, while the other two players will shoot N1 and N2 twice each with blowpipe shots. This typically will nearly kill or just straight up kill both of the ticks. When freezing as the South Mage, it really helps to place tile indicators for where South 1 spawns so you can instantly freeze it. This method is very hard to use for the South Mage if they have even remotely bad ping lag. The benefits of having an extra Venger in the raid definitely are lucrative if the Mage can pull it off. This does also work in 4s, but there really is no tangible benefit to it. If you're freezing all and notice the tick takes more than one step after freezing, you know you were a tick off and you will have to skip 2s to make up for it. If you are missing 1s or 2s, you will need to time your freeze on 3s so you can freeze them side by side instead of in a pile, as catching 3s and 4s is still tick perfect. Bloat is a relatively simple room, but it is very easy to wipe your team here if you fly them. Bloat is classified as undead, which is why we take a salve amulet into the raid. While Bloat is moving, he will receive 50% damage only. Bloat will walk around the room depending on his health remaining. If you are caught within line of sight of Bloat, he will rapidly fire flies at you that hit you for 10 to 20 damage. If your teammates are then within line of sight of you, they will also get hit for the same amount of flies you took. Bloat will drop meat from the ceiling in random locations marked with a shadow, similar to crystals during the Ulm fight. If you get hit by this, it will deal 30 to 40 damage and stun you in place for a few seconds. This typically is followed by you getting flied repeatedly because you cannot move, killing you and possibly the rest of your team as well. Meat cannot ever fall on the same tile, so if you move somewhere meat just fell, you are 100% safe from the next meat. After a short amount of time, Bloat will go down. This is signified by him not moving, and his yellow dots on his back flashing from yellow to black. At this point, he can be damaged by your team, and he will remain stunned for about 15 seconds. After this, Bloat will get back up and stomp on the ground. Anyone within line of sight when he stomps will be hit 40 to 80 damage. He will then resume walking around or running around the room. Bloat can turn and go the other direction mid-run, which can cause your team to get flied if not careful. Make sure you don't overturn corners during this fight. Bloat will almost never turn more than once per section, but it is still possible, so keep it in mind. It is very important how your team enters the room for Bloat. You want to have one person ahead of time who will be entering the room. This person will immediately run to the gate on the opposite side of where Bloat is. Pray ranged and enter the room with Bloat while the rest of your team waits at the gate. You know you have timed this properly if you take one fly as you enter the room. If your entire team had not entered the room when this person tries to enter, they will not be able to enter the room with bloat. Make sure you wait at the gate if any of your teammates are lagging behind and do not enter the room until the person entering has entered the room. The reason we do this is to guarantee bloat will go down closest to the gate, allowing your team to get the most hits possible. This also lowers the likelihood of him turning twice. If you brought anglerfish, Eat one of them before you enter the room. This saves time after the room is done, as you don't have to go back to grab your food, and this lets you be more aggressive with bloat. If you only took brews, drop one at the gate so you can equip your spec weapons. If you forgot to drop something, make sure you don't drop a brew next to the pillar during the fight, as your team can pick this up on accident or mess up their pathing due to it. 
as soon as Bullet goes down, enter the room, praying ranged and piety. If you are a BGSer, you should open with a single BGS spec. Bloat only has 100 defense, and he regains his stats after he starts moving again. The only reason you do this is for added damage from your team on the first down. After you have BGS'd, you will attack with Whip slash Scythe three to four times, depending on how close to the door he was, and after this, take a step back and Chally spec him, running back behind the pillar after this. If you are not a BGSer, you want to do three to four Whip slash Scythe hits, then drop a Claw spec. Then take a step back and Chally spec, immediately running behind the pillar as well. You want to open with your regular melee weapons, so you are able to spec after the BGSers have already lowered Bloat's defense. In more advanced teams, they will often tank the stomp in order to get in an extra hit. But as a learner, I would try and avoid all damage where possible to safely get through the room. Bloat will likely be damaged to the point where he is running after he gets back up. Make sure you're always on the opposite side of Bloat, and don't run too far past corners in case he turns and catches you out. The best way to avoid meat is to pick a tile you are going to move to next and make sure there is no meat where you are clicking to. After he goes down again, everyone should immediately run to him, do about 4 whip slash scythe hits, then take a step back and shally, getting back behind the pillar. The goal is to have killed him by this point, but it's fine if you haven't, just continue around the pillar like before, then when Bloat is down, run and hit him 4-5 to five times again. If Bloat has not gone down by the third down, typically this only happens when your teammates have died, run energy will become a concern. Make sure you are very careful if you are in the situation not to unnecessarily waste run energy and immediately get back to Bloat as he goes down, finishing with a Chally spec if it has regenerated by this point. Bloat should never survive past 4 downs unless something has gone catastrophically wrong. If he does, he will likely be out of run energy and die. After you have completed the room, drop your salve amulet and pick up your food if you dropped it at the gate, then go to the chest and fill your inventory with sharks for the Nilo room coming up. One of your non-mages should buy a stamina potion to pot share it before Nilo is coming up. I typically just elect for the ranged DPS to be the one who buys the stam. In more advanced teams, they will take every single stomp to ensure a 2 down bloat. You can take eat bloat stomp if you eat the instant the screen shakes after his foot comes down. You can also take eat flies if you eat as you see them coming towards you, but if you take eat and then get flied repeatedly after, you're still going to die from the next incoming fly. I bring Guthix Rest for this purpose. It heals 5 HP and has 4 doses so as to not waste actual food on tick eats. It also has the benefit of regenerating 5% run energy during bloat, which actually can come in handy, and it can overheal you so you can still tick eat when at full health. It also counts as a potion, so it wastes no ticks of your combat after eating it. In trios, when you enter the room, it's actually best to open with a chally, do 4 scythe hits, then chally again before getting behind a pillar, obviously tanking the stomp. This is the highest damage potential and will get you a 2 down most consistently. There is a harder strat where we let the BGSer enter the room first, they then wait until the proper moment and drive by spec bloat running through him. This maneuver usually will damage the specker for about 60 to 80 damage, so they will need to take eat future stomps. The BGS damage is halved when doing this, but this still drains the full defense for what it would have hit, similar to how SGS works. This also allows them to get an extra scythe hit on bloat when he goes down, which adds more damage than the additional BGS damage would add. The other BGSer can enter the room a bit early and also spec before he goes down, guaranteeing he hits one defense. When you enter before Nilos, you're going to want to drop some food outside or inside the arena so you can equip two-handed weapons and take your boots slash defender off if you're maging slash ranging. Pot share the stamina to everyone before you enter the room if you bought it. You should drop the remaining stamina dose in the middle of the room in case one of the meleeers runs out of energy. Drop some sharks in the center so people can eat them as they need them. The people meleeing specifically take a ton of damage. Now, Locus is easily the hardest room besides Verzik to learn, and if you are learning with people equally inexperienced, this is likely where you'll wipe the most. The idea with this room is waves of multicolored Nilocus will walk down the ramp. Some are predetermined to attack players, we call these aggros, and some will simply walk to a pillar and start attacking. There are four pillars in the room. If these are destroyed, they will heavily damage the entire team, and any Nilocus that were attacking the pillar will fan out and begin attacking your team as well. If all four pillars go down, your entire team will instantly die. The goal is to lose no pillars. If any one member of your team is not pulling their full weight, you're very likely to lose pillars. This room is the main reason for roles to exist within Tob. In 4s, this is a dedicated mage and ranger, along with two melees that also periodically hybrid to help the mage. The waves will always come down the exact same way, they are not random. In trios, you will simply have one of each role for the waves. 
The color of the Nilocus indicates both what attack styles it will use and what style it must be damaged with. Nilocus Hagios requires magic, Toxablos requiring ranged, and Iskrios requiring melee. There are both small and large variants of all these Nilocus, the large ones having double the health and a higher max hit, as well as splitting into a couple random variants of the smaller Nilocus. The health of these Nilocus scales with the amount of people in the raid. In trios, they have 8 health, and fours, they have 9. If these Nilocus are left alone for a long period of time, they can change colors to a different style. If a player damages a Nilocus with the wrong style, that player will not be able to attack that Nilocus again. This can cause problems if the Nilocus was an aggro you tagged, and then no one kills it with switching to your style. Say, a ranger accidentally tags a melee Nilocus that changes to ranged. Later on, Nilocus will also begin flashing to different colors as they come down the ramp. Make sure you don't hit these with the wrong styles, as they may be aggros. Towards the end of the waves, there will likely be a massive amount of Nilocus on all the pillars. It is the mage's job to freeze dump barrages on these piles of Nilocus. This not only kills any main Nilos on the pillars, but also prevents any Nilocus of any style from attacking the pillars for a few seconds, which is very important in saving the pillars. I'll be giving a breakdown for each role here. Feel free to use chapters to skip to the role you'll be performing. Because the Nilocus are always the same, this is a room you can constantly be improving in as you memorize where the Nilocus come from. After all the Nilos have been killed, and a short pause, Nilocus Vasilius will drop from the ceiling. If you are a ranger, make sure to pot share your three dose ranging potion to everybody, and everybody should drink a dose of super combat. Everyone should pray melee and piety, as the boss always starts with melee first. Then one of the BGSers should drop a single BGS spec as their first spec, then a Chally spec. The boss has only 50 defense, so it's not worth sending more than one spec. For everyone else in the team, they should drop one claw spec and one Chally spec. The way this fight works is fairly simple on paper, but very difficult to perform well at. This boss comes down matching the colors of the waves, always starting as melee. It will then every 10 ticks change colors to a different style that follows the combat triangle. It can only be damaged by that specific style, and will attack with that style until it changes. Vasilius' max hit is 70, if not protecting against it, so switching your protection prayers correctly is always the top priority. Attacking the boss with the incorrect style will reflect 100% of it back at you and heal it for the same amount dealt. Attacking Vasilius with a scythe off color can very quickly get you killed. Your character will automatically stop attacking Vasilius after it changes colors, so you don't need to click off of it like Zarpus. As a beginner, the best strategy is to simply attack Vasilius and open your prayer book, then change protection prayer when it changes, and then immediately gear switch into the next style and attack it, changing your offensive prayer after. After you beat Vasilius, grab any food you dropped and head into the next room. I'll be giving a breakdown for the waves for each role now. Just use the chapters to skip to the role you will be doing. Everyone has an opinion on which role is easiest, but really they're all equally important and none should really be treated as easier or harder than the others as there's always ways you can improve and do them better. Okay, so I walked up to the door, put on my full mage gear. I don't drop food outside because I want that for this fight. You can use all of your food at Nilo sometimes. So I get in there and I drop my sharks, unequip the defender and the boots to give myself more mage bonus, and I go to town. So it's first south, then that one on the right, and then this one on the left. That one on the left is an aggro, and I know I didn't kill it because I didn't get 12 XP, so I send another one. And I'm just killing these. Bam, bam. Okay, get that one on the right. Finish it off because I see it didn't kill it. That big one on the right is an aggro. I just killed it. Okay, now coming up is double, so I'm going to run left. Catching this can be tricky if you didn't do it right. So I caught that tick one, so I cast once at this guy, and then I barrage the south. And that fits it all tick perfect. I'll run over and throw a scythe swing here. Just help them out, assure that that aggro dies for the melees. This guy on the right. And I actually didn't finish this aggro on the right. I always forget about this one. That one on the left there is an aggro, so I'm trying to kill that. There we go, finished it off. I see my heart's up, so I hit it again. And I always am trying to throw barrages at any of these doubles, so you'll see a barrage here. Because barraging two is always way better than casting, even though it's a tick slower. 
Now this ranged on the right is an aggro and it flashes to mage, so I can help him out by hitting that. But he actually one shot it with his pipe, so no big deal. Run over to the left because that's an aggro. I one shot that, perfect. None of the rest of these are aggros. And I'm just trying to clean up here, prevent this stall from happening. And I'm going to try to stay south because this is a melee aggro and I can actually hit it with a mage hit. This is where a lot of pre-hits come in after this. So I hit this guy. Didn't kill it, so I let them know. I run over to the right here because devils are coming up. Cast barrage on that. Run back over to the left because this is a melee aggro. So I catch that with a cast. Didn't kill that. Then I catch the left one here. That's a melee aggro. So that confirms that dies. Now I hit this left one. And then when this range flashes to mage, I hit that as well. Then I go south, hit this one. That's my aggro. And then I can catch this range. That's going to be a melee aggro. I'm not killing a lot, but I'm still catching the cast. And this last mage is an aggro here. And none of these mages are aggros after that. So I'm just kind of casting, trying to clean stuff up. This is a point where you should start throwing uh, barrages really religiously. So that guy on the left or on the right is going to be a mage aggro. So I've got my melee helping me out with these aggros and I'm telling them where to cast. Well, that gives me time to dump barrages everywhere, which is really going to save us from taking a lot of damage on the pillars. So both of these mages are aggros here, and then that big mage is an aggro, and then we're done with aggros. And we can see that pillar's real low, so I'm just trying to dump as many barrages on it as I can. And unfortunately, I missed that cast because it died. Here I'm yelling at uh, the ranger to grab that uh, range aggro on that bottom right pillar. And it was tight, but we got it. I'm staying in my mage gate here just in case that big guy splits into some mages. But he doesn't. So I just throw on my uh, scythe here, take this one out, and throw my full gear for the boss fight. Make sure you're in the middle so your range pot gets shared to you. All right, melee roll. I'm walking in unpotted. So I'm going to wait to pot with my Divine right before this uh, Nilo comes down the ramp. So as soon as I pot here, I'm going to go in a big loop. I actually forgot to pot there. That's okay. So I go up, and then I go right. And we go left. Then up again. And then I like to try to throw a mage hit in between here. I was kind of slow on it, so I just didn't get it, but that's the idea. And I get this little guy, run up here and grab this. You, with your second melee, you're kind of spreading out and each taking a half of the arena. And I'm getting ready after this. I'm going to want to cast at the big mage on the right. I was a little slow on it. And I actually killed it in one shot there, easy. That's an aggro and you want to help your mage get it. Then each of you goes on either side of the arena. You'll see we both are on each side and we both scythe them. Then we grab this big guy, run up here and grab the little one. That little guy there was an aggro, I actually missed it. Basically I'm just trying to use meat as much as possible and I'm scything doubles when, when it's possible. When you have another melee, you actually do want to both be hitting the big ones with meat and not scything them. Here I'm getting ready to pre-hit this mage aggro, the range aggro. And I hit a zero, but get the idea. And I run over to help the mage hit that one as well. And I didn't really have something to hit there, so I threw a barrage. Probably shouldn't have, but... I want to be in my staff here, because what's coming down next, I could pre-hit with a mage hit. That guy. So I pre-hit my own aggro, and then I throw on the scythe, and I hit that. But the mage actually killed it for me, which was very convenient. And then the doubles are coming up. I could have thrown a meat hit if I was fast at that other melee while waiting, but that's okay. And then the next doubles are coming down, so I still wait there. My other melee is just running around cleaning stuff up while I do this. I hit this guy. I should have been hitting that south one. And these two right ones are both aggros as well. And I got him. So here you want to switch into a staff and help your mage kit that aggro on the right. And nothing else is an aggro. So here, you really are just helping mage stuff. Your goal is to kill the aggros. So that right top mage is an aggro, so you're trying to kill that. Basically, you're trying to free up time for the south mage to barrage. 
And here we're stalling a little bit, so I'm like wasting time, throwing some barrages out, whatever. Barraging typically isn't great as the melee, but I didn't really have much better to do. And I cast at both of these. The two little ones and then that big one next are all aggros. And that's the end of the aggros. So here I sometimes like to mage a little bit just to avoid the popping crabs. They do a ton of damage and things are just exploding constantly at the end here. If the pillar health is good, I like to keep maging. But here I'm just cleaning up any stragglers I see. Throw on the staff, why not? Take out that mage. Get that other mage. And of course it has one health. I'll just send it another cast, make sure it's dead. And that's it. So if you put on your full melee gear and your claws, ready your spec, make sure you're potted, throw on piety and protect melee. Uh, make sure you're healed over 50 health as well. If you're below that, you can get KO'd by the boss during the fight. And range roll. This is actually my weakest roll, so I'm actually recording a clan member who's pretty good at it. What you want to do at the start is immediately kill that one on the right. That's an aggro. You also want to drink a range potion and make sure you have rigor on this whole time. He's just running a big circle here. Hit that big one. Nothing's an aggro yet. Grab any offshoots here. Basically, you just want to be, always be clicking as the ranger. You have two ticks between shots, and you don't want to waste any ticks. This big guy here is an aggro. And we just clean up a little bit. Got this guy on the right. Okay, for doubles here, there's one on the right that's an aggro, and that one underneath that big ranger on the left is also an aggro. So you want to catch both of those. And catch that south doubles if you can, too. Then you're really just clicking things, cleaning up. You can mage here a little bit in between if you have no rangers to hit. Kill that big guy on the left first. Guy on the right is an aggro. Actually got missed here. And none of this is an aggro. You're just cleaning up whatever you can while you wait. You want to run over to the right here and pre-hit this ranged aggro. And he didn't kill it here, so he'll shoot it again. You really don't have to worry about your own aggros for a while. You're just cleaning up on pillars. It is possible to pre-hit that south melee aggro if you run up there. And there's doubles on the left. You want to wait for them to get a bit closer, and then you chin them. It gives you the highest accuracy. And you can actually pre-hit that south aggro as well for the melees. And if you're quick, you can also pre-hit that right ranged aggro that turns into a melee aggro. And nothing else at this point is an aggro. You just want to clean up as much as you can. Spam shots everywhere. Sometimes there's a lot of rangers and you can throw chins at the pillars as well. And grab that south. That's an aggro. And back to spamming shots like before. None of this is aggro. Again, like I was saying, you really with the range roll, just want to make sure you're always clicking to the next uh, Nilo. Even if you don't kill it, you should be clicking to the next thing so you're not wasting ticks. You can double chin that last clump of rangers up at the south if you're quick. And that's it. That's cleanup. So just spam shots, clean everything up. See, so he's chucking some chins here. Piping anything. Pipe that guy. And that's it. Make sure you share the ranged potion to everybody and equip the BGS if you're going to be the one who BGSs. Improving at Vasilius is all about not missing hits in your most powerful DPS setup. For best DPS, it goes melee, then ranged, and then magic. One of the easiest improvements you can throw in is simply switching your offensive prayer to the one that would benefit you the most next after getting your hits on the current style. For example, if I've just hit Vasilius with two scythe swings, I can switch my offensive prayer from piety to rigor before he changes styles in the hopes he switches to ranged. If he doesn't, I would simply switch my gear into mage and attack, then switch the offensive prayer to augury for my second attack. You can do the same with gear, which we call a pre-switch. With the last example, 
Having just done my second scythe swing, I can switch my offensive prayer to rigor and quickly change my gear to ranged. And if Vasilius changes to magic, I can quickly put on my magic gear, do an attack, then switch my offensive prayer after for the last hit. You always want to pre-switch to whatever style will give you the greatest DPS next, should he change to that. To maximize the amount of damage you can do on the phases where you have the greatest DPS. It's also good to keep in mind a staff is 4 a tick, so it is very easy to get your two mage hits, versus something like a scythe or tebow, which are both 5 tick. Sotetseg is not incredibly difficult, but making a mistake can instantly get you killed. And you also can easily wipe your whole team with a single mistake, so you need to stay focused. Sotetseg is a stationary boss that uses two different types of attacks. Melee attacks whose damage is only halved by Protect from Melee. This room makes Bando shine for its defense against melees, by the way. And Magical Orbs that split to two of your teammates as either red magic orbs again or gray ranged orbs. They need to be protected against. His melee attack has a max hit of 45, and his orbs have a max hit of 50. The orbs are far more accurate than his melee attacks. If an orb hits you off prayer, the attack will disable your prayers for a short period of time. And this can be devastating if you get chain gunned by multiple orbs. Missing a single orb can easily get you KO'd if you are unlucky. After Sotetseg has fired 10 orbs, melee attacks do not count towards this, he will fire a large red orb randomly at someone. If you tank this orb on your own, it will instantly kill you no matter your remaining health. Stacking with your teammates will spread the damage out evenly across all of you. When Sotetseg is damaged to 66% or 33% health remaining, a random player will be chosen. This will be indicated by the word Sotetseg has chosen you on your screen. With the whole team being teleported back to the gate. The Chosen will be on a different dimension and will be shown a red path through the maze while slowly taking small amounts of damage. And the steps the Chosen takes through the maze will be directly shown to the other players. Wherever their true tile was, that tile will appear red to the other players. While following the tiles, after the third row of tiles, a red tornado will spawn behind them, slowly following behind. If you are too slow to follow the Chosen, the tornado will hit someone and damage the entire team for roughly 50 damage. If any player steps off the correct path onto a gray tile, the entire team, again, will receive 10 to 20 damage each tick that player is on the wrong tile. If the Chosen clicks across gray tiles incorrectly, every single person left alive will walk across that gray tile, which can immediately KO the entire team. After the Chosen hits the end, they enter a portal, which takes them back to Sotetseg, where the fight resumes. If this is your first time to Sotetseg, you will want to mark these five tiles. These signify where each person will stand, and the middle tile is where you will stack for death balls. Before you enter the room to Sotetseg, you want to lay out exactly who will be specking with Dragon Warhammers at what phase, as after each maze, Sotetseg completely regains his defense levels. Sotetseg has 200 total defense, and BGS is a pretty terrible spec weapon to use, as Sotetseg's defense level is capped at 100 minimum, similar to Nightmare. In quads, you will have one person spec during phase 1 slash 2, one person spec during phases 1 and 3, and one person specking during phases two and three. And one more person will simply fill if someone misses during any phase. In a trio, you simply drop the fill roll. People will signify their roll by typing the number of the phases they will spec during in the chat. If you miss your spec, relay that information to the fill roll so they can spec two. Typically, if not using voice chat, people will type a one for a hit or zero for a miss in the chat. If the team got lucky and landed most of their hammers, and the fill has additional specs in the last phase, with two hammers landed, the fill can dump their claw specs instead, as lowering his defense more past this point is pretty worthless. You will want to all stand equal distances apart from Sotetseg to allow yourself to see the orbs. Your teammates should spread out with one person on each of these four corner tiles. If this is your first time fighting Sotetseg, I would just camp Magic Prayer and switch to Range Prayer for incoming orbs, not using Protect from Melee. Melees are definitely not a small amount of damage, but they can be out-healed, unlike orbs which can just flat out kill you. If you start to get a feel for it, start trying to pray protect from melee in between orbs. If you get a large death orb, your team should stack on the middle tile shown until it lands. Typically you should pray mage as you can't really tell who the orbs will be going towards while you are stacked. After you damage Sotetseg enough and someone has chosen for the maze, turn off your prayers. This is a good time to get your hammer equipped if you will be specking next phase and activating spec. I also will try to eat the sharks if any were left over from Nilos at this point if my health is drained a bit. The chosen player should step on the maze to the third row of tiles and wait a bit for the team to get to that tile. When your team is ready, run through the maze as quickly as you can safely go. If you are new to how movement works in RuneScape, as a learner, I would literally just run in straight lines early on. 
I have a movement guide that can help you learn exactly where your character will move when clicking that can help run the mazes safely faster. There is also a maze trainer you can do online that shows you the fastest route through the maze and accurately simulates ticks and has you click through the maze. This is really accurate to how it is in game and it is a great tool. I'll leave it in the description. I definitely wouldn't overtrain until you are tick perfect through the mazes if you're going with newer raiders or hold back a bit because they won't be able to keep up with you and you can wipe your team by being too good at mazes. If you are following, make sure you are immediately clicking on the next red tile as soon as your true tile updates. If your chosen runs you over a gray tile, don't hesitate or God forbid stop on the gray tile and just continue going as stopping will certainly get your entire team killed. This also goes for the chosen, although you realistically should never be running incorrectly. Like, mistakes do happen. If you mess up, warn your team and keep going. If you stop on a granted tile, you are guaranteed to kill your entire team as well. You will likely kill at least one person if you mess up a single gray tile. The fight stays the same after this, spec in the orders you have chosen, and continue doing damage. You'll get a final second maze at 33%, and after that, so did seg will go down. Make sure you chally spec if you have more than 30% spec near when the fight ends. There are many things you can do to improve your Sodat segs with some experience, and these actually make the fight go significantly differently. Like Maiden, you can start the fight with an Ice Barrage or Tebow shot and switch in your melee gear as you run up. The Vengers on the team should constantly be keeping the team venged, if they have over 45 health. With Avenge, I will activate Redemption instead of my Protection Prayers and tank melee hits as Redemption is not disabled by orbs, and this indicates I currently am Venged and I'm going to tank a hit. If a single orb is coming, I will tank that for extra Venge damage. So it's like attacks every 5 ticks, the same as a Scythe. So if I drop below 45 health, where melee can kill me, I will begin flinching so it's like attacks to avoid his melee attacks. If you are using a whip, you do lose ticks flinching so it's like, so I would not tank Vengeances without a Scythe. When a Death Horde comes towards you, if you have lower health, you can elect to tick eat it. This has very precise timing, but has some pretty obvious tells for when you need to hit. When you see the orb coming, take one step back from Sodatseg and wait. When you see the ball completely envelop your character, you can eat your food to tick eat it. This is when Guthix's rest really comes in handy. Another indicator many people use is when he starts the animation for his next attack when the ball is on top of you. This is also the tick you need to eat to survive. If you move farther than a tile away from Sodateg or stay next to him, the animation for the ball will be a bit different. If many or all of your teammates have died, this may be the only way you can survive a death ball. Keep in mind you can't tick eat with something that doesn't overheal you if you are at max HP. You need to be either drained or eat something like an angler, a brew, or a guthix rest. You can also skip death balls if you start a maze as they are fired by Sodateg. If it feels like you are close to a death ball, you can elect to bait it out when you are one or two hits from starting the next maze. Then as soon as it comes out, hit so to take down, start the maze, and skip the ball. You can easily get through the entire fight without taking a death ball with this strategy. If your entire team dies and you start a maze, so to take will choose you, you will run through, and then be forced to run through the maze after with no indicators. If you are trapped in this situation, you can take a screenshot of the maze, then mark tiles using rune light after you exit the portal to get through the maze. It is possible to clutch an entire last phase if you brought a gothic rest or some brews. Although this requires successfully take eating 5 plus death balls and properly flinching the entire time. After the fight, this is the final resupply chest you will have access to before Verzik. Drop any sub 4 dose resource or brews as well as any sharks you have left over on the ground. If someone brought an additional ranged potion, they can pot share it to the team at this point. If you have more super combats than 8 doses, drink or drop the extra doses at this point as well. You should also drop a Book of Darkness or Soul Runes if you brought either of those, as well as releasing any leftover chins, and drop your Guthix Rest if you brought that. You can sip it first for an extra 5 HP. Everyone on the team should buy one Stamina Potion, 3-4 to four Super Stores, and the rest of the inventory should be Brews. Make sure you buy these last. If you have extra points, buy Brews and drop them for your teammates. It's important to stock your inventory carefully, as the supplies you take into Verzik can be the difference maker between successful or failed raid. If you are on a more advanced team and can scythe walk Zarpus, it's usually smart to also pre-pot a stamina here as it will completely prevent you from running out of energy at Zarpus. Zarpus is the easiest room of the raid, a quiet before the storm that is Verzik. Zarpus is the only room you absolutely should use no supplies during, as not only will you need all of your supplies for Verzik, Zarpus is so easy that you should never even need to use a supply. Make sure you get the 16 middle tiles marked if this is your first time to Zarpus. Zarpus has several phases. 
At the beginning of the fight, Zarpus is invincible, and Graves will randomly appear around the room that will add health to Zarpus if not stood on. You will want to spread your team evenly around the room to optimally stand on these graves to prevent Zarpus from gaining additional health. After a couple of minutes, the graves will all disappear, and Zarpus will begin hovering in place, no longer invincible. Zarpus will begin firing poison blobs in order at all of your teammates through the orb order, top to bottom. These will damage you if they fall within one tile of your character. To avoid damage, you will have to be at least two tiles away. The blobs can also be split off of your teammate's splats and chained to someone else. These only will be fired or split off the tick Zarpus turns towards someone, every four ticks. After Zarpus has been damaged to 20% to 30% of his health remaining, the amount depends on how much he was healed by Graves in the first phase, he will screech and begin turning to a random quadrant of the room for a short period of time. If you attack Zarpus while he is facing your quadrant, you will be recoiled for 60 to 80 damage per splat. With a scythe, it will deal a 60 to 80 for all three hit splats, basically instantly killing you. When Zarpus is damaged down to zero health, the room will end. When you enter the room, have each person take a quadrant of the room and drop a bruise so you can use a two-handed weapon. You're going to want to mark these 16 tiles around Zarpus if this is your very first time in the room. Only two graves can be active at a time in a four-man, so as soon as the third grave spawns, you can safely step off your grave and either back to your quadrant or to the next grave. In a three-man, only one grave will be active at a time, and the beginning takes much longer because of this. This phase doesn't really change the fight a ton, if you miss some graves, it's not a huge deal. Make sure you have your full melee gear and Warhammer equipped. When all 15 graves have completed, or 12 in a trio, and you can damage Zarpus, drink a super combat if you are not potted, enable piety, and drop both of your hammer specs on Zarpus. The two B jesters should hold their spec and attack Zarpus a few times with melee until hammers have been dropped. If at least three hammers have hit Zarpus, the BGSer can dump their specs now. As several hammers missed, you can have one of the BGSers back up with additional hammer hits until you hit three hammers, and then dump BGS specs. Zarpus has the highest defense of any boss in the entire raid, 250, so it's very important you intelligently spec, or this fight will take a ridiculously long time. Try to be conscious of what tile will get painted when you are specking. Make sure you do it from a corner, and if you have scythe walkers, do it from a corner that won't affect them. If you move back after the first spec, then spec again after he turns, he won't paint any tile near him. If you are all ranging, don't worry about this too much, and just don't paint a main tile. If this is your first time at Zarpus, or you have a lower KC, after specking, move to the corner of the room you held down for Graves phase, and swap in ranged gear. At this point, you will constantly be attacking Zarpus, and only moving when he looks at you. Each time Zarpus turns, there is a chance a blob will split off of someone else and heads towards you. And if you are constantly moving, he will quickly paint most of the room. If your entire team is ranging, it's best to move in a zipper pattern like this, to condense the amount of tiles painted. If anyone on your team is scythe walking, you want to stay out of their way. So the zipper method goes out the window because they use the third row, not you. Typically, you will want to walk the outer edge clockwise if people are scything. If you run into a teammate, you can move above your hit splats and start going the other way. You want to only use the first and second row if possible to stay out of the way of your scythers. Keep in mind while attacking Zarpus that his hitbox goes up and down with the space under him having no hitbox. Always click the shadow to avoid misclicking under him and taking large amounts of damage. After he screeches, you can shoot him a few more times before he starts turning, then switch into melee gear. Be vigilant and don't miss the screech. I know it's hard. This room really is a snooze if you're ranging. If you continue firing AFK at Zarpus after he screeches, you're almost guaranteed to die. This part of the fight is incredibly simple if you are using a four tick weapon, like a whip. Simply attack Zarpus twice per head turn. Zarpus turns every eight ticks, which means your weapon cooldown fits perfectly inside of this. You can move during a weapon cooldown in between attacks to near where he is currently facing, then move to the location he is facing after your second attack, as he will never face the same area twice in a row. You will only move to the marked yellow tiles. This is why it is very important not to paint them earlier in the fight, as you will be using them now. You can see on this graphic how your whip attacks fit within his cycle perfectly. And as long as you got two hits in on the last cycle, you can continue to get two hits in each cycle. With a scythe, it's a bit more complicated. I would recommend as a beginner just attacking Zarpus in a 2 to 1 cycle to be safe. Attacking Zarpus while he's facing you is guaranteed death with a scythe, so just play it safe while learning. Once he has hit about 5% health, your team can all chally to finish him off. After his health hits 0, pick up your potions and move on to Verzik. You need the staff for Verzik, so if someone has an angler, they can overheal with it to grab the staff. Otherwise, someone should drop a brew and pick up the staff. The first big way you can improve your Zarpus speeds is scythe walking. This is less important than you would think, 
As his blowpipe with dragon darts actually does more damage than a scythe here, as Zarpus is reduced to one defense with the standard walk method. And rune darts is almost the same DPS as scythe. This matters a lot more in trios where it is likely he won't be reduced to one defense, but in fours it's pretty rare you can't get his defense near one. Scythe is much more DPS if he has not been drained of defense much. Blowpipe will also beat a Tebow in this room unless he was hardly drained. Scythe walk for Zarpus is the exact same timing as Scythe walk for Verzik, as both have a 4 tick cycle. So I wouldn't attempt Zarpus walking until you are really comfortable with walking at Verzik, as painting tiles does hinder your team at Zarpus if you mess up. Zarpus is a bit different from Verzik in that you are looking for a Q to get off instead of a Q to get on like with Verzik. Zarpus' turn is the equivalent of the tick Verzik bounces. This is the tick poison blobs are calculated and will fly towards you. You need to be off of Zarpus the tick he turns and then get back on. My cue to begin attacking is when Zarpus turns towards someone, and the tick to get off of Zarpus is when you first see the blob of poison coming out of his mouth towards someone. Immediately after Zarpus awakens after the gray phase, you'll want to spec, then immediately move away diagonally, then when he turns, spec again, move back, then switch into your scythe, then wait for his next turn to get into your cycle. You typically want to scythe walk clockwise so you don't run into your teammates, who may also be walking Zarpus. You have limited space to work with. If you take too much damage or rag a bunch of tiles, it's probably best to just get out and start ranging. You will rag tiles while you learn, it's just the way things work. Don't let that stop you from learning. You typically can walk the same tile four times before having to move to the next tile, but I really don't count attacks or anything. Just watch the blobs. If the tile is going to be painted very soon, just move to the next tile. There's also a harder method that wastes no tick scythe walking, involving ragging the corners on your fourth hit in the cycle so you're always hitting but I still haven't gotten this fully down yet, so I won't be explaining it in this video. With a scythe as a learner, I recommend doing two to one after Zarpus has screeched. Two hits, then one hit after the turn. But you can get more hits in than this. If you are tick perfect, you can fit a two, two, one, two, one cycle. I made a chart so I could actually visualize this and figure out how exactly you do it. It's actually pretty simple. If you hit Zarpus the same tick he turned, that means you can get two hits the next time he turns as well. You will hit a tick before he turns on the second cycle if you do this correctly. You then do one hit, then two hits, then one hit again and repeat. To stay in this cycle, you need to queue up your attack in Zarpus's face, so make sure you understand how your hits will line up if you go attempting this. Verzik is by far the most dangerous boss of the raid, as the final boss should be. Verzik has three phases, a pillar phase where you swap around the Dawnbringer with your teammates and spec Verzik down, a second phase where she moves to the middle of the room and will fire bombs at your team, and a final third phase where Verzik transforms into a spider, alternating ranged and magic attacks. These phases are really more like separate boss fights than phases. Before you do anything in this room, if it is your first time, get your tile indicator sorted out. These middle tiles are for phase 2, and the tiles behind the pillars indicate safe spots from the phase 1 magic attack. Choose a spot to drop your potions in between a set of pillars someone has not dropped yet. These indicate where you intend to stand for the phase 2 fight. Make sure you have at least one person with either a tentacle whip or serpentine helmet on each side to poison the purple tick on phase 2. You will want to drop a large amount of potions if you are new to Verzik, as if you die with them, your team can't utilize your potions. For someone brand new to Verzik, I typically have them drop all but 2 brews and 2 restores. As you get more comfortable with Verzik, you can start dropping fewer supplies. You need to have at least 2 inventory spaces open so you can pick up the staff and equip 2 handed weapons. When you've marked all of your tiles and dropped your potions, stand at this corner of Verzik. If you're not the first person in the orb order, drop the staff, if you took it, so the first person can pick it up to start the fight. Phase 1 is a pretty easy fight, but you can still very easily get KO'd if you are not playing carefully. You want to play this phase perfectly, as you desperately need the supplies for the later phases. Taking damage during P1 is a huge waste. The main idea with P1 is that you and your team will all take turns specking with the Dawnbringer and attacking Verzik in between her attacks. Your regular attacks are capped at a max hit of 10. The Dawnbringer is not capped, and the spec damage does from 75 to 150 damage. The Dawnbringer also cannot splash like the pillars at Nightmare. Her magic attacks have a max hit of 68 through prayer and will hit anyone inside her line of sight. When hiding behind a pillar, Verzik will instead throw her magic attack at the pillar instead of at you, damaging the pillar. After around 4-5 to five attacks, the pillar will collapse, damaging you for around 50 damage if you are right next to it as it collapses. After the first pillar collapses, your team will move to the other northern pillar and continue damaging Verzik as before. When you're ready to start the fight, walk to this tile and pray magic. Standing on this tile indicates to your team that you are 100% ready to begin fighting Verzik. If you do not activate Protect for Magic and take a mage hit, 
it has a max hit of 137. So you're almost guaranteed to die instantly. This fight will rely heavily on everyone paying attention and specking at the proper times. You will cycle through the orb order of the team using your specs as they regenerate. The Dawnbringer uses 35% per spec. The entire team should be spam clicking Verzik ready to start, and the person who is first in the orb order should have the Dawnbringer spec primed, spacebar through both dialogue screens, and select yes to start the fight. Do not repot or use prayers like piety during this fight, as they are not worth the lost prayer points. The first in orb order should fire two specs off, then immediately drop the Dawnbringer. Where the second in orb order will pick it up, and also fire two specs, then run behind pillar. You can easily get off four whip hits or three scythe hits during this initial period, if not using the Dawnbringer. You now want to drop the staff of the pillar for the next person in the orb order, who will pick it up and again spec twice before getting behind the pillar. Two whip hits is very easy to fit in per attack, or two scythe hits, which has only one tick of leeway. You should click to attack Verzik when she spreads her legs wide. If you want to be 100% safe, you can click on her when she claps, although this will be a tick later, then you can actually leave safely. After the third person specs, they should drop it at the pillar, and the fourth should pick it up again, specking twice. After this, you loop back through orb order, as everyone should have regenerated one more spec. Keep in mind the pillar can go down after any hit at this point, so make sure you move away from the pillar when she attacks. After the pillar goes down, you can still attack Verzik twice, then head to the other pillar. You don't have to do anything weird. Your character runs very quickly diagonally away from Verzik to make it back to the other pillar. After the last person uses the last of their spec, Verzik should either go down or be very close to going down. If you are forced to, you can use the back pillars. If you're forced to do this, stop meleeing Verzik and swap into Mage, doing two to three Mage hits instead. After Verzik's HP hits zero, all the remaining pillars will collapse and she will move towards the center of the room. Make sure you are not near the pillars when she goes down. Phase 2 involves everyone going in for hits on Verzik, avoiding her the ticks she attacks to avoid getting bounced. She fires ranged skull bombs every 4 ticks that explode on contact with the ground. After every 4 bombs, Verzik will fire a lightning ball at a random target. This will bounce between your teammates up to 4 times. If it does not get bounced into Verzik, the final person it bounces to will get hit for around 50 damage. This can easily be avoided by bouncing it into Verzik, or she will take the damage instead. This is why where you stand for P2 and attacking her is very important. She also will occasionally summon multiple Nilocus bombs that will target a specific player and will slowly walk towards them. When it hits a tile next to the targeted player, it will stop moving then explode a tick later. Depending on the proximity to the Nilo when it explodes, it can deal up to 64 damage if you are in the exact center of the Nilo. Reducing each tile away down to 8 at 2 tiles away, and 0 at 3 tiles away. She will also fire a large purple orb at a random player when she summons Nilocus. This also deals damage based on proximity underneath it, dealing over 50 damage if directly under it. After it hits the ground, it turns into a large purple tick that will gradually heal Verzik. This needs to be poisoned to stop the healing and deal a large poison splat and damage to Verzik. After Verzik is damaged to 35% health remaining, she will summon two red ticks on each side of her and put up a barrier around herself for a short amount of time. Any damage dealt directly to her during this period heals her for the full damage dealt. She will start attacking again after a short period of time, lowering the barrier. These ticks are similar to the ticks at Maiden. They will heal Verzik for their full remaining health after several attacks from Verzik. Verzik will also begin using magic attacks that heal her, while still occasionally firing her skull bombs. When you start P2, each person should be standing on their tile for Verzik on the side they drop their potions. Take the brief window of her moving to the center to repot and activate piety and protect from ranged. Even if you have a scythe, I recommend using a whip for this phase if you are inexperienced as you have much more lenient timing with a whip versus a scythe here. The idea here is you will be going in for one hit right after she attacks, then get out in a zigzag pattern if using a whip, avoiding her bombs and not getting bounced by standing next to her. My cue to attack her is her cape moving. This is the first tick of her attack. Make sure you are zigzagging towards the center of Verzik instead of above or below her, as this can cause lightning to bounce to the other side of Verzik without hitting her. If you get bounced, she can randomly damage you up to about 40 damage just from the bounce alone. And then you are almost guaranteed to get hit by a bomb because you can't move as well. If you get bounced, immediately click back on, and this will get you back into cycle. When she summons ticks, avoid standing underneath the purple orb if it is being fired, and continue attacking Verzik while waiting for the ticks to approach. If one is coming towards you, just wait until it is one tile away, then run three tiles away. Make sure you don't run to the edge of the map, as if lightning comes towards you, it won't chain to your teammates and just straight up hit you a 50 if you are too far away. The bomb's timing is also much slower for everybody, so you risk hurting your teammates if you run really far away. Poison the purple tick when you get a free hit if you have a tentacle whip or serp helm. 
Once Firzik hits 35% health remaining, activate Protect from Magic, and begin attacking the ticks. Because they heal Verzik 1 to 1, you don't want to damage them beyond what your max hit is, as you could just be attacking Verzik instead. The only reason we even attack the red ticks is that Verzik is immune to damage for a bit, and they have very low defense compared to Verzik's. If you have a mix of some people scything and whipping, scythers should get back on Verzik after 2 hits, as they only get 2 hit splats with a scythe on the ticks, so whippers should be the ones lowering the ticks' health. After Verzik's health is lowered, she will drop from the ceiling and turn into a giant spider. Pick up at least some potions you drop to this point and eat up. Phase 3 is the final challenge of Tob. It is a DPS race and where you will use the majority of your food. Verzik will heavily damage the entire team, similar to Nightmare, alternating between magic and ranged attacks randomly. The damage from these attacks is not calculated until they hit you, similar to Jad or Nightmare, so you want to switch your prayers to whatever attack is coming. These are clearly telegraphed. Throughout the fight, you want to keep your health above 60, and always recombat pot after you have brewed to full to keep the damage coming. Brews don't prevent you from attacking, so make sure you keep hitting while healing. When the fight starts, Verzik will select a tank at random to target. If the tank is in melee range of Verzik when she attacks, there's a chance she can melee the entire team for up to 60 damage. The goal is for the tank to be either under Verzik or stepping away from Verzik whenever she attacks to prevent melee attacks. If the tank is outside of melee range for more than two attacks, Verzik will swap tanks to a different random player. She will attack with four regular auto attacks before using one of her special attacks. And these are all in the same order every time. She summons ticks, and then she does webs, and then she does musical chairs, and finally she will throw a death ball, and then repeating. When she summons ticks, these are the same as in phase two. They will approach a random player and explode when nearby that player. You want to spread out before they are summoned so you can tell who they are targeting, and pull the ticks away from the tank if they are targeting you. Try to communicate with the tank if ticks are targeting them. After four more attacks, Verzik will walk to the center of the room and begin spraying webs at everyone on the team. If you step into a web, you will be stunned in place. At this point, your team can either attack the web, freeing you if they deal at least 8 damage to the web, or you will take a round of 50 when it disappears. Teams that have a bit of experience can web run here, where you wait on the tile for Verzik to get to the center of the room and spam clicker. Then hit and wait a tick, then run and hit Verzik on each side of her. If you are not running, just throw on magic gear and staff and hit Verzik as you run around her clockwise, freeing anyone with your staff that might get caught in webs. There's a delay before Verzik attacks after webs, so the tank can hit twice before going under Verzik. After webs, the next special attack is musical chairs or yellow tiles. Verzik becomes completely immune to damage, and yellow tiles appear randomly around the arena, one for each player. These signify safe spots. You must stand individually on a tile to avoid the yellow balls Verzik fires. If two or more people are standing on a tile, everyone will take the full damage of the yellow orbs, which is around 70. This part requires careful coordination. It's best to stay on a tile when you get to one and not move, typically, to keep it simple. If you are absolutely screwed and you can't get to a tile, you can fairly easily tick eat this yellow orb. You actually have about two ticks to eat before it hits you. If you aren't confident in the timing, just start chugging brews and you will usually be fine. She should be almost to 20% by this point in the fight. Her last special attack is Death Ball. This fires at a random person in the team and will hit them for a 74. You usually just want to tank this, which is why you want to heal to 115 with Bruise during musical chairs. If someone else is standing on top of you when the ball lands, it will bounce to them instead, dealing a small amount of damage to you both, targeting them instead. If you manage to bounce it to three unique players, the ball will dissipate, hitting everyone for a small amount of damage. This is almost never practical in a fight. I actually haven't ever done it in a fight personally but I often will take the bounces from teammates during the tornado phase when she is almost dead to completely avoid having to deal with it. When she is drained below 20%, Verzik will become enraged. This is by far the most dangerous and difficult part of the raid. Verzik will summon a purple tornado for each person in the raid. Where they spawn and who they target is random, but each player will have only one tornado following them. You can only get hit by your own tornado. And if you do, it will take half of your current HP and return it to Verzik. For example, if a tornado damages you a 30, it will heal Verzik 3% of your total health. This coupled with the fact Verzik no longer attacks every 7 ticks, and now attacks every 5 ticks, means not only will you be taking way way more damage, this special attacks will come faster. Make sure you communicate with your team before you start this phase. If she's near 20% right before a dangerous special attack, especially musical chairs, you should hold off attacking her until the attack has ended. Once you hit her below 20% and spawn tornadoes, Make sure you are moving as the phase starts. You can usually run through a tornado and still avoid the damage. 
but if you're standing still, you are pretty likely to get hit. You should quickly dump both claw specs. If your entire team dumps both specs without taking a tornado, that's usually enough to instantly KO Verzik. If you are tanking during this phase, just continually run away from Verzik, getting one hit per her attack to avoid melees. If you get stuck in a corner, you can still run through Verzik to avoid melees. The priorities during this part of the fight are 1. Not taking a tornado, 2. Not dying, and 3. Hitting the boss. Taking a tornado extends this extremely difficult part of the fight tremendously, making it much more likely your team will take more tornadoes and subjecting them to ridiculous amounts of extra attacks from Verzik. The goal is to not have to deal with special attacks during this phase, and just skip it as quickly as possible. But if you do have to, explosive ticks are basically the same as in the regular fight, just more difficult. Web running is the same, but usually only one person makes it to this part of the fight. If only one person is running webs, there's a chance they shoot in front of you, so make sure you are running a bit further each hit to avoid this. Getting caught in a web is a guaranteed tornado, which we really don't want. Musical chairs are the hardest to deal with. You need to run further away from the yellow tile to lure the tornado away, and then run towards it. If you get the timing off, don't take the tornado, just take eat the yellow orb and keep moving. This is why we wait to start the sub 20% until after yellow tiles. Finally, death ball is the same to deal with before 20% as well. Bounce it around if you can if she is almost dead to avoid it completely. There are many ways you can improve at Verzik. On P1 when you are not picking up the staff, you can open with a claw swipe and then do 3 scythe hits, getting back behind the pillar tick perfectly. You cannot fit a full 4 scythe hits. With a whip you can easily do 4 hits every single time. You can also switch into your staff when behind the pillar and do a pre-hit immediately switching into Scythe and getting two hits on Verzik after. It's best to throw on some Ancestral or Void pieces to increase your chance of hitting, but this also makes it a lot harder. Keep in mind this tightens the window to tick perfect when pre-hitting, because you waste a tick on your first Scythe hit at Verzik. You can do the same with the Dawnbringer after the first four people have used two specs, pre-hitting with the Staff Special Attack, then doing your two Scythe hits, dropping at Verzik for the next person to also pre-hit with, and doing the same until everyone is specced. For P2, Scythe Walk is one of the more difficult cycles to learn in the raid, but easily one of the most important. Verzik has a 4 tick attack cycle, and the Scythe is 5 tick, so we want to stand next to Verzik on any possible safe tick, getting off only when she attacks. Basically, to get into the cycle, you still click when you see her cape move, but you click back onto the bombs when they explode. You can't rely on visual indicators all the time, as there are times where she will not shoot bombs or your teammates can run far away, changing the timing on when the bombs land. There's a useful trainer for this in the description. It allows you to add things like ping delay and different settings. For me personally, it doesn't feel 100% accurate, but this is a really good start for learning. If you want to learn in-game, you can also train on any metal dragon. I prefer bronze dragons or iron dragons as they hit you the least if you mess up. Iron dragons are right near the entrance to the catacombs. Bring full tank gear and an anti-dragon shield with any low damage 5 tick weapon. I was using a bronze mace here. If you take any damage, you know you would have been bounced at Verzik. Practice running from the dragon in different orientations so you get very comfortable. I recommend doing this for around 30 minutes before attempting Scythe Walk in the theater. If you're one of the players with Lunars, you can posture your teammates' super restores occasionally during the fight to save total resource. The easiest way to do this is during your off tick while attacking Verzik, or at any time below 35%. For P3, the most important place you can improve is when Verzik drops below 20%. Doing damage is very difficult during this section of the fight, and requires practice. I found many learners get to this part of the fight and run around like a chicken with their head cut off, often taking tornadoes and doing zero damage to Verzik. If you were doing this, it would actually be more beneficial to your team if you were just dead instead. The easiest way to improve at this is to stop worrying about your own health. Just pray magic and stop switching prayers. The fight is going to be over in 10 seconds anyway, if everyone focuses. Dump both claw specs and get a hit at every possible time you can. Even while you are healing, as those hits well brewed down, still matter a lot during this phase. When I was learning this, it felt like I was doing everything I possibly could, but looking back at recordings of my gameplay showed I really was wasting a ton of hits running around doing nothing. If you are one of the Avengers and are fairly comfortable with P3, you can pot share a stamina potion to everyone before webs begins, allowing your team to take more brews instead of stamina potions. The easiest way to always make it to webs is to count 4 attacks after ticks come out, then stand in the web style. When tanking, you can also implement one tick tanking. This involves walking away or under Verzik only the tick before she attacks, allowing you to sometimes get an additional scythe swing on Verzik. This is pretty difficult to implement, as messing it up can get your team killed pretty easily. When learning, I usually only attempted it until I caused a melee, then went back to one to one. There are many methods people use to do this consistently. My personal method is watching for a hit splat on my teammates, 
then hesitating a tick, and then moving a tile. This only works if your teammates are right next to Verzik when she attacks, as a hit splat will appear later if they walk away from her. It's also very important you immediately steal as many potions as possible after the kill ends. Leaving your teammates a single potion is actually considered rude. Think of it as picking up leftover garbage for your friends after watching a movie. It's a very kind gesture. After you have defeated Verzik, you can enter the treasure room and claim your loot. You can check the strategy table to see details about the raid and who is the MVP. A chest will be available for each player in the raid, with a purple outline denoting that the chest contains a rare drop. The regular loot is typically enough to pay the supplies used if you are a scythe user. The average loot from a deathless raid is about 400k. You get a bit less in the quantity of your drop depending on the amount of deaths. A deathless raid will always have a 1 out of 9.1 chance of providing the team with a purple chest, no matter the scale of the raid. This is why trios are more profitable. The purple is most likely to go to the MVP of the raid, and likelihood of who it goes to after that is affected by their total MVP points earned in the raid. MVP points are given to a player who dealt the most damage in a room, with two for each boss and each phase of Verzik, except for Nilocus boss and Sodateg, which provide only one point each for most damage. Each death reduces your point counter by four points. What item you get is random. Avernic is the most common purple with an 8 out of 19 chance. Every other purple except the scythe is on the same table, including each piece of Justice CR armor, each item having a 2 out of 19 chance. The scythe is the rarest, having only a 1 out of 19 chance. The average deathless 4-man chest, if splitting, is worth an average of 3 mil. Each death reduces the average value by about 150k. A 5-death 4-man raid chest is worth an average of 2.3 mil, just as an example. The average deathless 3-man chest is worth 3.8 mil, with deaths mattering much more in the calculation each reducing the average loot by about 225k. Again, the average 5 death trio is worth about 2.7 mil on average. Try to exit in the order you want the orb order to stay, as the order players leave the raid will become the next orb order if you do another raid. Or you can just recreate the team after to keep the orb order you want. And that's it for the video! This is my longest video yet, and it's taken hundreds of hours to create! So definitely leave a like if you liked it, or subscribe. Thanks guys!